My name is Rod Morris. I represent the AMP Plus Alliance, which is an open alliance of over 400 uh, companies that share and create profiles to enable an interoperable ecosystem of over 25 million devices. Uh, that includes native support in a growing number of cell phones. And AMP Plus has been built on the ultra low power wireless protocol AMP, which is become the de facto standard in several sports monitoring applications such as biking and running and continues to grow into new markets such as health, medical. I'm Mike Foley, the executive director of the Blue Tooth SIG. The Blue Tooth SIG is a membership organization with over 15,000 members around the globe. We're responsible for Bluetooth technology, meaning we publish the specification and administer a certification program. The results of those efforts have been over 7 billion products made by our members and bought by consumers. Hi, my name's Tim Fowler. I work for Cambridge Consultants. We're a design consultancy business. Uh, our objective is to help our clients identify novel product ideas and turn them into reality. Hi, I'm Tim Phipps from Cambridge Consultants. My particular focus is on the convergence of wireless technologies in the consumer sector with medical applications. Hi, I'm Dan Hammerson from RTX. Uh, RTX is a one-stop shop for, for development and production of, of wireless devices. I'm chairman, uh, chairman of the ULE, the Ultra Low Energy Working Group within the DEC Forum. My name is Troy Davis. I'm from NOcean. We're a company that's based in Munich, Germany, and uh, we provide ultra low powerless, power of wireless devices and modules to the OEM market to use uh, energy harvesting power and uh, leave the batteries behind. So none of our devices use batteries. Uh, they operate using the ambient light or motion or thermal differentials within the space. Hi, I'm Sven Egel Nielsen with Nordic Semiconductor. And Nordic Semiconductor is a small semiconductor company specializing in ultra low power wireless chips. We supply our own proprietary products, either AND products and also Bluetooth products. Well, welcome, gentlemen, to this uh, first Incisor TV ultra low power wireless roundtable. We're focusing on ultra low power today, but we're all um, involved in wider aspects of the, the wireless industry. I think we have a great group of companies here representing uh, organizations that manage sectors of the wireless industry and organizations that service sectors of the, the wireless industry. Um, we're going to talk through a variety of topics, but um, the first one is kind of pretty general, and that really is that uh, do we all think that the ultra low power wireless marketplace can really support? quite a number of different technologies that are all competing in that sector at the moment. From a Nordic perspective, we, we have a stated policy of supporting multiple platforms because we do think there's, there's yeah. room for more for, for, for set standards. But you got yourself, you know, even this group, you know, they, 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 there's, there's a lot of different standards out there. There are a lot of different technologies. And I personally think that there will be some convergence. There will be someone who cannot maintain, you know, their position in the market because the volumes are not big enough. You need to see the market develop first. I mean, the, the, the market out there, that's the segments and the markets we've just discussed about is, uh, well, it's, it's, it's still just starting. Um, smart metering rollouts are just starting. Uh, maybe 5 to 10 percent have been rolled out, but there's still 90 percent left uh, in Europe to, to be rolled out. That's one sector. Um, another sector is healthcare. Uh, healthcare is, is not at all penetrated with uh, wireless today. I think it's going to roll out differently in different verticals, in different sectors. And I think the sports and fitness, which is going to be driven primarily by consumers, what they purchase will roll out differently than perhaps a machine-to-machine -machine type sector where uh, you know, it's more the industry and you can go in with a more closed type of solution so long as you meet the requirement of that particular vertical. So I don't think one technology you're going to see be a winner take all. Are we saying that uh, ultimately there will be a dominant player in each of these sectors? I think it's difficult to say at this stage. I mean, from a, from a designer's point of view, 
often you think before you start a design exercise that you know what the technology that's appropriate for the job is. And as applications develop, use cases develop, and um, we learn more about what's needed, each of these technologies will evolve, and then I think we'll know which of them will become strong. Well, we're seeing, too, some of the more higher power consumption wireless protocols, such as, uh, I guess, ZB as an example, are using that sort of as a, as a backbone, and then they're using the, the an ocean protocol as um, sort of the leaves on the tree, if you will. So there, there's a good mix right now, I think. You so know, you so. think uh, as time goes by, more of you guys could end up you know, working across the table, holding hands and I, I think so. I mean, we do it on a, yeah, we do it on a pretty regular basis. Some of our largest installations in North America are a combination of uh, different protocols. And, um, you know, the big driver for us is, of course, no batteries and all the sensors and different things that are out there in, in the actual field. But then once you get it back to a wire, you can jump it with power and you can go over a wireless uh, signal that will cover greater distances. If we're talking about one technology that roots them all, um, as, as I think we already concluded that that's not going to happen. But you have different abstraction layers as well. You have the, the physical layer, which is just a, a yeah, the going from the antenna to the other antenna over the air. Then you have all the all the logical things about the, the data parts and how to standardize the, the different uh, data interfaces. Uh, uh, you have really good examples with both Bluetooth and with Zigbee where you have some profiles on top. Um, but those profiles, SCP2 for example, is, is a good example where the uh, Zigbee Alliance have opened up for, for others to come in and are now cooperating with uh, uh, home plug and with uh, Wi-Fi and with Deck Forum, uh, with regards to enabling different uh, Mac files underneath uh, some logical data link layer on uh, on top. Ultra low power is still a very broad term. I mean, yeah. previously there was low power, now there's ultra low power, but there's still orders of magnitude that differentiate the top to the bottom. And so, if you're talking about you know a particular technology, if if you want to get the best, the lowest power you still have to make trade-offs. And as silicon scales down, there's more space to actually have these different technologies existing on the same pieces of silicon, and that's already taking place. I think that's a good point in terms of, from a chip maker perspective, right, you, you can foresee, and not very far ahead, right, that the radios are, are just software configurable, that they will be run more or less any protocol, and can switch dynamically what they want to do <coughs> and support. Surely, any device that requires battery power is just a natural disadvantage. Yeah, I mean, I would agree. I think uh, you know, we've been in buildings that uh, are replacing their battery-powered devices, and you know, buildings that have eight to ten thousand batteries, and they have a full-time crew member who's going around and changing good batteries because you can't wait until it dies. You've got to change a good battery, so they're changing you know eight, ten thousand good batteries every two years, three years, five years, whatever it is. You know the first battery that you put into a sensor is fifty cents. The second one maybe a hundred dollars because you have to roll a person out there. You've got to roll a truck. You've got to get the guy out there doing uh, actually walking to the sensor, taking it apart, putting the battery in it, and putting it back. You know I have another. You know I think that I don't necessarily think you have to run without batteries. You just need to make sure that the one battery you put in lasts as long as the product lasts. We, we do a lot more work in the consumer space where you know it isn't so hard for the consumers to do it, but it's great when they don't have to. You're talking about a personal area network where every device you have is a battery operated device and they need to talk between themselves but be consuming low amounts of power on both sides of the connection. Then that's a different application and it needs different technology. I think this so. is a classic example though of different applications have different requirements and they're different solutions for them. You know, if I buy, if I'm a consumer and I buy a pedometer and the battery is wrapped in plastic and it lasts longer than my shoe lasts, that's to me the exact same equivalent as not having a battery because they never have to replace it. So uh, what we're saying here I guess is that there's some sort of a divide between pan applications and perhaps M to M or <coughs> industrial and office automation type applications in the way that devices will end up being designed. Yeah, there's also a, another one which is the home area network and if you look at at the gateways that are installed today well uh, Wi-Fi is always in there, DECT is uh, being uh, rolled out there uh, specifically for, for telephone usage but with uh, ultra low energy you can also use it for, for more than that and then you have uh, suddenly a house coverage from one access point throughout the whole house with, with one technology. So how far have you gone down the line? Is there now an official uh, ultra low power deck standard? 
It's being uh, built at the moment. Right. Uh, it's being built based upon the, the normal deck standard. Okay. Uh, and it's to be finished uh, within the next half year. Which, of course, brings us on to the uh, very important issue of standards. I mean, has everything got to be standardized? I mean, Sven, your business uh, supports both standardized and proprietary solutions. Which way is the market going to go? Do we need standards? I think standards are good, but they're not always necessary. I think if you look at the, the business that Nordic grows up, you know, mostly our proprietary things, we shipped half a billion devices. Proprietary. That's a tremendous amount of chips, right? And the customers who bought them were very happy not being a standard as well because they were simple, simple to use. It is nice to have a standard, but standards always comes with some cost. Yeah. And that's, you know, sometimes that cost can be too high. You know, there's, there's use cases where you don't need to be interoperable, but you just want to have a link and you want an optimal link that works better than anything else. And you can only do that with proprietary. There's no standards that can beat a good proprietary link, period. You were going to make a point, Mark. Well, to add on, what Sven said there is what do standards bring to the table? They bring interoperability to the table. And if you need products that interoperate where the consumer can select product from manufacturer A, B, and C and have them work together, standards are valuable. But you may be surprised to hear me saying this, running one of the largest standard groups in the world, but they they aren't required for everything. I agree 100% with what Sven said. The case I, I told about before with the with, uh, deck being rolled out in, in uh, numerous uh, millions of gateways, you have um, carriers like uh, Orange and Deutsche Telekom and British Telekom rolling out and they want standards. They need it because they need it for, for, for keeping the price down uh, of the equipment that they buy. They need multiple vendors and those vendors, they are mandating those vendors to, to be interoperable. Staying with standards for a minute, Rod, in your particular area, you, yours is a, your business came out of quite a specialized um, marketplace. How important has a standard been in the ant marketplace? Well, I, I don't actually see it as black and white as standard or not standard, I guess, mm -hmm. um, because I believe that you can have uh, somewhat more gray uh, implementations than that, and that's exactly what we do. We kind of bridge the line between some of the good points of uh, proprietary solutions that are customized to a particular application, and Ant was initially and specifically designed for sports monitoring applications, which is why it's so good at it. Um, but on top of that, we've created an open ecosystem of interoperable devices. An interesting concept for a gray standard, <laughs> <laughs> a movable standard. How does this type of uh, concept um, sit with the Bluetooth special interest group, Mike? Well, I think it's, it's fairly related. One of the difficult questions with standards is always, how far do you go? How much do you standardize? Because the standardization gives you interoperability, but you have to leave room for members to differentiate their products and, and, and enhance them. And what we found with Bluetooth is that line has kind of gone up over time as consumer expectations grow and expect more. Okay, so we've been looking at this largely from the, uh, the industry's point of view, but uh, Cambridge Consultants interfaces directly with a lot of people who actually use the technology and so How do they feel about standards? So I was going to say, for thinking about the medical community to start off with, I don't think they particularly care about standards. I think very often the more hard the medical requirement is, the more standardization actually is a, is a problem. Uh, they would like a proprietary interface that they can lock other people out of and that they can protect their business. So the openness is potentially an issue. But on the flip side, they will be sticking these things into the field and wanting them to work for years and being very upset if there isn't an ecosystem exactly like they bought into 10 years ago that's still in existence able to support their products. And is it the Continua Health Alliance that's managing this type of uh, expectation? Uh, so Continua has done that, but there really has been a, a proliferation, I think, for clients that we've spoken to, I think they, for different reasons, have independently come up with thinking that each of the standards and proprietary solutions out there is the best for them. And I don't think anyone has yet differentiated enough that says that is the one that's, that's going to dominate because that solution is better than the others. How important is the role of the smartphone in wireless sensor and control systems? Is an ability to talk to a smartphone vital to any technology? Depends on the application and the use case. Again, a lot of the areas that Bluetooth has been most successful are 
primarily driven by the mobile phone, and that's where we're leveraging. But there's some vertical applications where the smartphone doesn't matter. I'd say most of the consumer ones do, but it is application dependent. I, I think it's a little bit hard to predict because it's so new that this uh, smartphone becomes the terminal for wireless data entry, right? Yeah. We've had wireless connectivity to a smartphone for a while, and you can, of course, do Wi-Fi and, and these things, and Bluetooth has been along, but I think just now we're seeing that technology such as, you know, Bluetooth low energy and Ant also goes into to the smartphones, giving the ability to actually be a collection of sensor data. Your smartphone is just one screen, the tablet is another screen, your TV is a third screen. Again, looking to the smart metering, uh, one of, of the, the mandates that the, uh, that, that EU is coming out with uh, also tells about uh, that, that you need to be able, the consumer needs to have some kind of display. And now the, the way that it's been translated and worked with now is that it's not an, an necessarily an in-home display that's mounted on the wall or wherever in, you, in your kitchen or where it is. It's, it's, it's whatever display you have available. Okay, the word consumers has cropped up several times in the last few sentences. How much do consumers need to know about this stuff? I think they just want it to work, right? So um, I think when I, when I buy a Bluetooth headset and I know that my iPhone has Bluetooth in it, I just pair them together. I don't even think about it. I don't, I don't know what profile was used to communicate those, that pairing. I don't know what um, uh, data packets were sent back and forth, and I, I really don't care. And um, but when it doesn't work, I care. Uh, all of a sudden, I start to it's think. Never happened, yeah, it's it? never. It's <laughs> never. Yeah, it's not happened once. Good. No, good so good, it's yeah. uh, you know, and you know, I rent a car now, and I and I get in, I pair my Bluetooth headset to it. So, um, you know, there's uh, and it just works. It, it's slightly different in your world, there, Ron, because there, there almost seems to me to be a happy relationship between the average ad device user and the technology that he uses, whether it's a heart rate belt or a sensor on his bike or something like that. There, there seems to be quite a community thing going on there. Well, certainly um, athletes, and particularly competitive athletes, uh, a lot of them are very data-centric. And so uh, they very much care about data and quality data and uh, are definitely more, you know, we'll go through a lot greater will go to a lot greater lengths to get that data to wear all kinds of funny devices and so it's a bit of an interesting segment that way but I, I totally agree that ultimately the consumers just want it to work. I'd like to address the pairing thing because I am actually in the camp that thinks pairing has not been addressed at all to the level they should be because mm -hmm. you know it, it is still one of the biggest obstacles for consumers to do use wireless. It should have been priority number one but it ended up being number four and that I think the industry needs to work a lot more on this issue. So whose responsibility is it though? Who, who, you, know, you know, sometimes it's... Who's going to get this pairing thing right? Well, Mike uh, should... Uh, no, it's not Mike. The SIG should get... It should, should work even harder on pairing issues. And I'm sure that, you know, the, the Ant and Rod, they probably have, you know, could do some better work in this as well. Some of the proprietary success we have is because the link is already set up when it leaves the factory. It's actually so easy to use. Mm. That, that becomes a selling argument. It's been the same for, with DEC for years, um, that, that they were already prepared at the factory. A trend that I've started seeing a lot lately with Bluetooth products is for certain scenarios, you use NFC and Bluetooth together and do the touch to pair. And not just touch to pair, but also depending on what two devices you touch together, they launch the proper application so they're contextual touch to pair to use them. But why is it taking so long, Mike? Because I mean, NFC has been part of the, Bluetooth, the uh, relationship with NFC has been part of the Bluetooth spec for years. For a couple of years, that's mm -hmm. true. But uh, each organization, you have to get the base technology working individually before you can marry them together. Moving us into the uh, away from the consumer for a moment into the machine-to-machine -machine markets. Uh, can the short-range wireless solutions that we're looking at today successfully address these markets? Um, are new players coming into the markets likely to introduce new threats, you know, white space technology such as that? Can, can a technology like Bluetooth, for example, become widely adopted in a machine-to-machine -machine application? I believe so. For yeah. many of the applications used, I mean, uh, as we said earlier, I don't think it solves every problem in every space, but there are many machine-to-machine -machine use cases or applications that are very similar to a consumer one, and Bluetooth would work perfectly well in those, ex in those environments. Is there a case to be made for a simpler Bluetooth for a machine-to-machine -machine application? Uh, 
Potentially. I think, though, with the low energy solution, we're along that way where really very much defined is the radio and how you exchange data, but it's simple to add what data you need to exchange on top of that, and I think that's very well suited for a machine-to-machine -machine environment. This is very much your ballpark, Troy. Yeah, I mean, an ocean currently has quite a few installations where we're going machine-to-machine. -machine. They just operate independently, and, you know, we harvest the energy off of say the wires that are supplying the energy to that machine and we don't ever even clip into them we just clip around them and we use the inductive energy to power our, our device that says yes it's consuming power no it's not so here's another option on the other end what you do uh, well, how does feel about end -to -end? Uh, i'm a little bit with uh, with, with, with mike in this is i think bluetooth has a play here because we, we we see a lot of activities in in you know we already have bluetooth in the smartphones the pads the tvs are going to do it so we have the terminals in the house to communicate in the house for, for a home automation play. And I think that's, that is an opportunity for Bluetooth and Bluetooth Low Energy to do something. The installed base today of, of, uh, of Bluetooth gateways are in smartphones. And if, if I walk out of my home with my smartphone and my house is connected to me, then as soon as I'm 15 meters away from my home, then, then the connection is gone. Yeah. So there you need to have an alternative network. So I don't really agree with you uh, on, on that point. Yeah, it will be, it'll be the TV in the home walk the floor. I mean, every uh, new TV coming out, the smart ones are having Bluetooth in them, and that will be the, uh, the hub in the home. But they also have Wi-Fi. Yeah, sure. And Wi-Fi gives you access to, to your access point, your gateway, which is the gateway yeah, to, use Bluetooth to the Bluetooth from the sensors to the TV, Wi-Fi from the TV to the internet. Wi-Fi is not the technology to collect, like, low data or sensor data. I don't think so. Why not? Uh, Wi-Fi. Well, Wi-Fi is, is, is there today. I mean, it's it's just a contestant. I don't know this is interesting because, because it's low power, though. I mean, yes, we can say low power Wi-Fi, but it's, it's is it really than lower than, than, than the existing, than right? Again, yeah. Yeah. Well, we have at RCX, we have existing prototypes uh, below uh, 10 microamps. Uh, uh, of, of, of Wi-Fi when it's uh, sleeping. Uh, of course, when when you, yeah, yeah. But if you uh, just need to submit a little data, uh, then. Uh, it's, it's no, it, it, this ultra low power Wi-Fi thing has amused me as well and I'm, I'm interested to hear that there's some fairly strong opinions on this. Unfortunately we don't have anybody representing the Wi-Fi Alliance here but is, is, there oh, thank you, Mike. <laughs> is there really such a thing as ultra low power Wi-Fi? Can any Wi-Fi solution be regarded as ultra low power? You know, yeah, yeah I mean our, our sleep currents are you know in the 80 nanoamp range so when you're talking 10 microamps it's you know it's quite a bit different. Let's throw this one out there. Is Zigbee an important player in the ultra low power market? No. <laughs> you can have time to think about it. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. No, I'm just kidding. You know, Zigbee's been around for a long time. Yeah. If you accumulate the volumes they shipped over that time, it hasn't been very great so far. They say it's going to be next year, it's going to be the big thing, and maybe it will. But at the same time, when I, we've been watching Zigbee as a company for many, many years. I mean, we've worried about it before. But, you know, at the same time as Zigbee's can move forward, there's come a lot of new technologies competing with them. Tim Tail is like an ocean, right? And so I don't know. I was always kind of surprised that your company didn't get into the Zigbee market. We didn't see the volumes mm -hmm. in the space. I, I think the difficulty for Zigbee is its original primary goal is to solve complex system solutions. And while it's a laudable aim, actually, if you look at who's deploying, so the, the classic use case was electric light control. Um, you know, I don't know what it's like in many markets, but certainly the markets I'm familiar with, you know, electricians who put in lights are not sophisticated network engineers, you know. Uh, actually screwing metal terminals down in cables is pretty straightforward. And um, putting in a network and having to associate a switch with a particular light or set of lights is more complicated. And so I think that system sale has been a burden to them. It's quite a nice idea. It's pretty well executed. The problem is that how do you then convince the guys who are currently installing wired systems to replace them with wireless ones? Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think that's the problem it faces, not that it has a technological disadvantage, it's just a difficult sell. Zigbee seems to be clinging on to the idea that it's the technology of choice for smart metering and so on. Do, do, what do we feel around the table? Is Zigbee going to own that market? No. Uh, it's unknown who's going to own that market. The evidence that we see is that um, the different geographic markets may well deliberately choose alternate technologies. Again, it depends on the carrier and the regulations in, in the area. And uh, in, in some areas, they will regulate uh, a specific uh, 
um, a specific technology, but in most areas they will more regulate again on, on the on the interfaces. I mean, and and on the use case. Actually, I think one of the challenges is going to be for these home automation and industrial automation applications is going to be when white space radio starts to take off, where there's a simple matter of radio propagation where a lot of the devices we've talked about have been in the 2.4 gigahertz band. As you go down below a gigahertz for white space radio, there's a number of new applications that will be enabled by the fact that you've got greater propagation and greater range for the same amount of transmit power. So suddenly a new set of applications will be enabled and some existing applications in that space that were somewhat protected by being the only solution available will suddenly have some stiff competition. So I think that's going to be disruptive in that market. So we've had various uh, thoughts throughout the discussion about certain technologies being more suited than others to certain application areas, but each technology always seems to want to grow into new sectors, obviously to grow businesses, etc. You know, but how do you do it? I mean, Rob, for example, I know that you're working hard to drive AMP beyond the original set of applications that it was used for. I mean, how, how do you take on what must be a huge challenge? Yeah, certainly. I, I mean, we do it uh, through our membership. I mean, it's, it's really, uh, we get driven into new markets by the companies that want to take our technology there. Uh, so what sort of area would you see us first seeing ants in where it's not today, for example? <coughs> well, we're getting a lot of interest actually in um, asset tracking, so yeah. active RFID tags. Uh, is something that uh, has a lot of promise uh, that we have uh, some members that are looking actively at. What about some innovation? We've got several medical devices that will be coming out this year. Um, lots more industrial automation. Um, there's some aircraft communication, uh, vehicle communication, tire pressure monitoring. But where might we be starting to see Bluetooth in the coming years that we don't think about today? Well, we're kind of taking a dual mode approach, if you will. We're uh, standardizing key use cases that our members want to around health and fitness, uh, health care, the home area, things like that. But we've also put a concerted effort to ensure that platforms are out there. And those are the mobile phone, the tablets, the PCs. I think in a year, the TVs will be a Bluetooth platform. And those allow downloadable apps. So somebody in their garage or this small company can go out and create a Bluetooth application, a Bluetooth product, the piece of hardware, as well as the apps that are downloaded to those platforms and create a whole new industry. Well, let's start to uh, move towards wrapping this up. Give me your thoughts on what are the most important things for developers of ultra low power wireless technology? The ease of use area was uh, one, one key one. The products have to be simple to use and the value proposition. I like the design houses. These guys are the ones who really decide how that happens. I also think it's important that as an industry we make things easier for the developers. Rapid prototyping of hardware, that would be looking for. That would be great. Devices are going to continue to get cheaper, smarter, and better at doing things, more, more functionality. I'd like to see sort of further support for um, some of the standards in some of the basic platforms, or, or better support, should I say. Opening up the internals of the chipset solution in order that we can embed more applications and do more processing on the chip itself. Apple's adoption of Bluetooth Low Energy, I think that will allow a lot of prototyping of very simple have-a-go applications. I would definitely um, look a bit broader than, than to the embedded device, uh, but look more at the end-to-end -end, uh, and see uh, optimizing uh, of processes. Okay, well, um, for what it's worth, my view on this is that uh, all developers of wireless technology should be thinking more about the front end than use of the consumer use of wireless technology. Make people really want to use this stuff, then they'll buy it.